Well, welcome to another Friday night. Often when we finish a series, one of the things I like to do is just take a night before we start a new series to just give encouraging quotes. And so over time, I collect all of these helpful quotes that I find that deal with recovery from addiction and trauma stuff. And so tonight, that's what I want to do. And one of the beauties of quotes sometimes is they just are golden nuggets. They, they, they have condensed into a few words a world of wisdom. They just say stuff in a way that grabs us. And so I hope that as I go through and read all of these different quotes, that it will be encouraging to you, that it will just help you, especially if you're at a difficult time in your life right now. I just, again, hope that you'll be encouraged. So I usually like to start with some comical ones. So I don't want to adult anymore. I don't even want a human. I want to goat, jump around randomly, eat what I want, and headbutt anyone who annoys me. Another one, people talk about having an inner child. I don't. I have an inner old lady who says inappropriate things, tells everyone to be quiet, and wants to go to bed at 8 o'clock. And then two people in addiction recovery, AA, how long do I have to work the program, the newcomer asks. The sponsor says, until you die from something else. Then this one, people think addicts love drugs, wrong. Addicts love anything that will distract them from the fact that they don't love themselves. The habits you created to survive will no longer serve you when it's time to thrive. Get out of survival mode. New habits, new life. Maya Angelou says, My mission in life is not merely to survive but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor. And then somebody said this, childhood trauma can lead to an adulthood spent in survival mode, afraid to plant roots, to plan for the future, to trust, and to let joy in. It's a blessing to shift from surviving to thriving. It's not simple, but there is more than survival. So well said. And then somebody said, A note to anyone who needs to hear it. We don't get over, quote-unquote, or move on, quote-unquote, from our trauma. We are forced to make space for it. We carry it. We learn to live with it. And sometimes we thrive in spite of it. Another very helpful one. Teacher, what does it mean to work on yourself? And the teacher's response It is to stop waiting for others to change. Somebody said this, I'm a huge fan of people changing their lives. I love seeing people get sober and show up for their kids. I love seeing people go back to school. I love watching miracles happen. It takes so much strength to come back from nothing and rebuild your life. And that's why this next one I think is important. Those seeking therapy are not weak. It takes emotional strength to open up about your struggles. Zig Ziglar said, Getting knocked down in life is a given. Getting up and moving forward is a choice. No matter how long you have traveled in the wrong direction, you can always turn around. Somebody, Alice Little, says this. As traumatized children, we always dream that someone would come and save us. We never dream that it would be, in fact, ourselves as adults. I didn't grow up having role models. I grew up having people I didn't want to be like and seeing situations I'd never want to be in. Not all of us are dealt the right cards, but that doesn't mean you can't reshuffle your deck 
for a better outcome. Not one scar on my heart came from an enemy. They all came from people who, quote-unquote, love me. And that's one of the very sad realities about some complex trauma. C.S. Lewis said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Or to say that another way, somebody has said, you have the power to say, this is not how my story will end. Sherry Mandel put it this way, trauma creates the need for you to recreate yourself. And I love this one. Healing our tra childhood trauma isn't so much about focusing on the traumatic events themselves. The rock that was thrown into still waters, it's more about understanding the ripples, the ways we adapted in order to cope, and how those adaptations continue to impact us in adulthood. Very well said. Another way somebody has put it is this. They asked her, can time heal you? She answered, you are the key to your healing, not time. Hurt, trauma, and dense conditioning will continue sitting in your mind, impacting your emotions and behavior until you go inward. What heals is self-love, learning to get, look, go, let go, self-awareness, and building new habits. And I love this short six-word statement. We repeat what we don't repair. Dr. Lauren Fogel, if someone else's reaction seems out of proportion to the situation, it usually means that something else was triggered. In other words, when somebody's actions are not in proportion to what is happening in the here and now, it usually means something from the past has been triggered. Somebody has put it this way, I release myself from the versions of me I created just to survive. I don't have to keep being that person. Somebody said, healing doesn't mean the pain never existed. It means the damage no longer controls our lives. Carrie Fisher said, sometimes you can only find heaven by slowly backing away from hell. Avoiding your triggers isn't healing. Healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain, the pattern, and the story and walk your way to a different ending. You're going to continue to be triggered, but you can change how you respond to that trigger. Then this, please understand this, bad chapters can still create great stories. Wrong paths can still lead to right places. Failed dreams can still create successful people. Sometimes it takes losing yourself to find yourself. Beautifully said. Sometimes I wake up and have to remind myself there is nothing wrong with me. I have patterns to unlearn, new behaviors to embody, and wounds to heal, but there is nothing wrong with the core of me and who I am. I am unlearning generations of harm and remembering love. It takes time. Somebody said, healing, it doesn't have to look magical or pretty. Real healing is hard, exhausting, and draining. Let yourself go through it. Don't try to paint it as anything other than what it is. Be there for yourself with no judgment. And then sometimes the hardest thing and the right thing are the same. I love that. And you will find that in recovery. Sometimes the hardest thing and the right thing are the same thing. Then this. Everything in your life is a reflection of a choice you have made. If you want a different result, make a different choice. 
Yasmin Cheyenne says, a part of healing is acknowledging what you didn't receive in the past, plus deciding to get it, give it all and more to yourself now. So it's meeting the needs now that were never met in the past. Demi Lovato said, one of the hardest things was learning that I was worth recovery. Somebody said, one day you will thank yourself for never giving up. Another one, recovery is a process. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes everything you've got. You can't do it half-heartedly. And then this, people don't change their behavior when other people yell at them, shame them, or send them away to be alone. People change their behavior when they feel heard, understood, and loved. Growth and change require connection and compassion. Karen Salmonson says, give yourself time to heal from a challenge you've been dealt. Letting go of hurt doesn't happen overnight. It happens in slow, small steps forward, plus a few steps backwards at times. Be gentle and patient with yourself. Then this. Trauma is, is a result of an overwhelming sense of danger, powerlessness, and fear. Healing is a result of feeling safe, empowered, and supportive. And this, your healing is about you. It doesn't need a stamp of approval from someone else. Don't worry about how long it takes or how ugly it may seem. It's about you. Then this, it is exhausting to constantly be at war with yourself. I know you are trying. You are seen. Strength. You are strong for getting out of bed in the morning when it feels like hell. You are brave for doing things even though they scare you or make you anxious. And you are amazing for trying and holding on no matter how hard life gets. So recovery is hard. That's the point these statements are saying. But then... Brittany Burgunder said this, recovery is hard, yes, but regret is harder. Courage isn't having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have strength. And you're going to have days that you feel like that. Healing from childhood trauma can be a very lonely journey. Your friends, family, and significant other may never fo fully understand it. Understand that you do not need to apologize for who you become after you survive. Then this one. They say, and that's others saying to you, they say, oh, that was a long time ago, as if you don't need to deal with it today. But in reality... It's still happening. I am told many children block out the memory of trauma. In fact, the healing process can only truly begin when we are willing to remember. Until you heal the wounds of your past, you are going to bleed. You can bandage the bleeding with food, with alcohol, with drugs, with work, with cigarettes, with sex, but eventually it will all ooze through and stain your life. You must find the strength to open the wounds. Stick your hands inside. Pull out the core of the pain that is holding you in your past, the memories, and make, them, make peace with them. Beautifully said. You do not have to be defined just by your dysfunctional family. The freedom is in realizing that you are carrying someone else's burden, your parents, your siblings, your community. That was not yours to carry in the first place. Give your inner child the permission to pause and unload. 
As every therapist would tell you, healing involves discomfort. But so does refusing to heal. And over time, refusing to heal is always more painful. It takes time to heal emotionally. Moving on doesn't take a day. It takes a lot of little steps to be able to break free of one broken self. Relearning safety after living a lifetime in patterns of fear is not going to happen overnight. Remember to walk with grace. You deserve to be held gently as you rebirth. Healing is not easy, nor is it perfectly balanced. It is a roller coaster of ups and downs, stops and starts. It is one step forward, five steps back. It is leaps and bounds through the clouds and then crawling on bloody knees through the dirt. It is a journey of reawakening the light and then tumbling back into the abyss. But for every moment spent in the dark, you cast off a thousand points of light. And you are just beginning to shine brilliantly. So don't you dare give up now. Karen Salmonson again says this, Often it's the deepest pain which empowers you to grow into your highest self. And Beth Moore says, I am better off healed than I ever was unbroken. It's important to remind yourself that it is not a race. Do what you can do today. You will get to where you are going. Progress happens in layers. People don't give themselves enough credit for overcoming things and getting better. Like you made it this far, celebrate your strength. Never forget we are, that we are in a relationship with ourselves. This means our own emotions must matter to us. This means we must acknowledge and validate our own emotions. This means we must not dismiss or disapprove of our own emotions. And this then becomes an important part of beginning in the recovery journey. You must always be willing to truly consider evidence that contradicts your beliefs, and admit the possibility that you may be wrong. Intelligence isn't knowing everything, it's the ability to challenge everything you know. And I love this one. Listen, people start to heal the moment they feel heard. If you don't love yourself, you will always be chasing after people who don't love you either. Or if outside validation is your only source of nourishment, you'll be hungry for the rest of your life. And then you will never speak to anyone more than you speak to yourself in your head. So be kind to yourself. The broken little girl still lives inside of me. She was left behind by everyone, suspended in time on the exact day her childhood was torn away, waiting for a warrior, warrior to rise from the ashes. I no longer try to silence her. Instead, I comfort her. I tell her how strong and smart she is. I tell her all the things she desperately wanted to hear all those years ago. Solitude is a peaceful state that allows you to go inward and visit yourself. Loneliness is stepping inside and realizing that no one is home. A quick list of things you are not. You are not a burden, damaged goods, a waste of time, stupid, weak, unlovable, broken, less important, a failure, ugly, or alone, things you may need to remind yourself of regularly. And then this, the importance of good people in our life is just like the importance of heartbeats. It's not visible, but silently supports our life. 
stay away from negative people. They manage to find and point out every little perceived flaw or insecurity they think you may have. Nothing you do or say will ever be good enough. Negative people have to put others down in order to feel superior about themselves. Their negativity has absolutely nothing to do with you. And then I love this one. Don't let your loneliness make you reconnect with toxic people. You shouldn't drink poison just because you're thirsty. Do not expect positive changes in your life if you surround yourself with negative people. Overheard someone say, you cannot heal in the same environment that made you sick. And that's probably some of the best advice I've heard in a while. Dr. Bruce Perry, who I quote regularly, says this, The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change, and the most powerful therapy is human love. And then he says this, connectedness has the power to counterbalance adversity. Fire can warm or consume. Water can quench or drown. Wind can caress or cut. And so it is with human relationships. We can both create and destroy, nurture and terrorize, traumatize and heal each other. Another one from Bruce Perry, relationships matter. The currency for systemic change was trust. And trust comes through forming healthy working relationships. People, not programs, change people. A relationship without trust is like a car without gas. You can stay in it all you want, but it won't go anywhere. Another one from Bruce Perry, the truth is you cannot love yourself unless you have been loved and are loved. The capacity to love cannot be built in isolation. The repeated theme, we need healthy connection and relationships. Another one from Bruce Perry, it is the rare and strong person that can carry their trauma without having it spill into the next generation. In other words, if you don't deal with your trauma, high probability you're going to pass it on. This one, you can't keep getting mad at people for sucking the life out of you if you keep giving them the straw. Stop asking why people keep doing it and start asking why you will keep allowing it. This one is so insightful. You cannot fix someone who doesn't want to be fixed, but you can ruin your life trying. And then if you can't figure out how to be kind, figure out how to be quiet. Helping is doing something for someone that he is not capable of doing himself. Enabling is doing for someone, things he could and should be doing for himself. I am not impressed by money, social status, or job title. I am impressed by the way someone treats other human beings. Two things you are in total control of in your life are your attitude and your effort. When you can't control what's happening, challenge yourself to control the way you're responding to what's happening. That's where the power is. Or another way to say that, Liz Stanley says, being able to access choice in every moment is the biggest possible protection we have against trauma. Live less out of habit and more out of intent. One of the most powerful truths we can offer our children is the knowledge that we're all still learning. None of us have arrived. We all have room to grow. This frees our kids from expecting perfections of themselves or anyone else because they know that life is a journey from day one. 
Another one from Bruce Perry. Surprisingly, it is often when wandering through the emotional carnage left from the worst of humankind that we find the best of humanity as well. In other words, when we deal with the carnage of complex trauma, sometimes we find these beautiful people, and it's those who've dealt with their trauma. And then a final one to those who are caregivers. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and lost daily and not be touched by it is, an unre- is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. I hope those are encouraging to you. I hope they just meet you where you're at and just help you in your journey and remind you of some important truths. So that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break. I'll come back and do the Christian part. And for those of you who aren't interested, not a problem. We'll see you next week. For everybody else, we'll be back in a minute. Well, welcome back to the Christian part. Come today to the last episode on the life of Joseph, and it's his final words before he dies. And he says this, Soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers, but God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give Abraham, which is the land of Israel. Then Joseph made his brothers swear an oath, and he said, when God comes to help you and lead you back, you must take my bones with you. In other words, he wants his brothers to take his remains back to Israel. So Joseph died at the age of 110. The Egyptians embalmed him, and his body was placed in a coffin. But 400 years later, when Israel finally came out of Egypt and went back to Israel, they carried Joseph's coffin with them. So I want to make just a few observations from these final words, but also about Joseph's life. I hope you've been impressed by how remarkable this man is. So for 17 years, he grew up in a very dysfunctional family, but with a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather who were following God. And then he spent the next 93 years of his life in Egypt, in a very different culture, very different religion. But here, at the end of his life, he's still following the God of his fathers. So, first thing I want you to realize. Somebody has said this. There are three very powerful things that once a person is exposed to them, has the power to corrupt them. Money, sex, and power. So once a person gets a lot of money, It has the potential to corrupt them. Once they get in positions of great power, it has the potential to corrupt them. And once they can just have all the sex they want, it has the potential to corrupt them. Do you realize that Joseph had money, great power, and potential for all the sex he wanted? Yet he was never corrupted. He had all three corrupting influences as part of his life, which would have put tremendous pressure on him to live unhealthy, to abuse that stuff, and he never did. He had one wife, and he remained faithful to her. He never mistreated people under him. 
He never lashed out. So Potiphar's wife, who had thrown him unjustly into prison, and Potiphar, who had been part of that, he was now over them. And he didn't take out his anger on them. He was not corrupted by the things that corrupted people all around him. That shows a strength of character that I just pray I will have and grow and continue to have in my life. But there's a second thing that I want you to see. He wants to be buried finally back in Israel. Even though he only spent the first 17 years of his life there, the last 93 years of his life has been in Egypt. That's been his home, you would think. That's where his wife, his children, his grandchildren have grown up. That's their home. But what is he saying? Egypt is not really my home. My home is where God said it should be. My home is the land God promised to me. I don't want to become too ingrained in this culture, too in love with this culture, too controlled by this culture that I never want to leave it. My heart belongs somewhere else. My home is where God wants me to be. I just love that about him. Wanting to be not necessarily where other people think his family and home is, but being where God chose for him to be. And that is such a liberating truth in our lives is that when we follow God, we don't have to be controlled by some of the other things that people say this should be your home because this is where your family is. No, I want to be where God chooses for me. And then the final thing. Joseph was confident that God would lead his brothers back to the promised land. Now, what is interesting is that Joseph's life now would be a parallel to what Israel was going to go through. Israel came to Egypt because of a famine. They stayed and settled there. Then a new government in Egypt took over and didn't like the the Jewish people and made them slaves, just like Joseph had been made a slave. They were treated cruelly and unjustly. They cried out to God, but nothing changed. It looked hopeless, just like the same for Joseph had looked hopeless. But Joseph hang on to a promise that God had given him in a dream. And I think... Joseph's life was to be a ray of hope for Israel. God promised that he'd take us back someday to Israel. Even though we're slaves, even though it looks like God's forgotten us, even though it looks hopeless for us, because what can slaves do to overpower a powerful government? God did it with Joseph. Maybe he can do it with us. And so Joseph's life becomes a roadmap, a beacon, a ray of hope for others who would follow. I love that. Because as we go through our dark valleys, as we go through our trauma and heal, part of what we went through with our trauma were dark days where we felt God had forgotten us. Dark days where... We thought God's promises for us would never happen. But they have. And now our life can be a ray of hope to somebody else in a dark valley. And I think that is such a wonderful thing. But take that a little bit further. Joseph's faith deepened in God through all of that hardship. But what is fascinating to me is Joseph's faith deepened in God in the midst of a culture who didn't follow God, in the midst of a culture who didn't know his God. Joseph's faith deepened when everything in his external world worked against a deepening faith. 
his faith grew in an environment where you would think faith wouldn't grow. And that is often the case for people in the days of recovery that they have lots of opposition. They're in an environment that is not healthy for them, but they keep trusting, they keep working, and their faith deepens in God. And so faith can deepen in the most unlikely places. And when it deepens in those places, it becomes a strong anchor for life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us the story of this man. A man where we feel humbled. A man where we feel challenged. A man that causes us to say we want to be like that man. We want to grow to be faithful like him, to trust like he does, that our life would be a ray of hope and a beacon for others. Just encourage people, challenge us all. Amen. Well, again, thank you for being part of our Friday night. Hope tonight has been a